the SPI has moved up about 90 to 20%. And we, I think we can easily see the market hitting even 13,000 levels by the end of the year. And even at that, I think we'd still be trading at eight to nine times. We all know that purchasing power has significantly crashed with the private consumption also uh, significantly declining. If you look at our effective tax rates, now it's at 50%, whereas in Vietnam, it's 20%. Oh, so okay. it explains why uh, investors are queuing up uh, you know, at Vietnam to do business. Hello, today is the 27th of July 2023 and so far this year the stock market is up over 30%. Uh, the current run in the market or the current increase in stock prices started uh, after the government announced its plan on how it plans to restructure domestic debt, that's the treasury bills and bonds. Um, and uh, here with us today are three analysts uh, who are primarily here to discuss how to build an equity strategy, given that it looks like equity is going to be your favorite asset class, at least for the next uh, few years. And, um, uh, and first, in this lineup is uh, Trisha Pires. Trisha is head of research at Cal. Trisha, good to have you here. I'll, I'll start with a question to you, right? When you were looking at potential for equity in January this year, January 2023, uh, you probably made some assumptions about where we'll be towards the end of the year. And, you know, you now have the benefit of hindsight to see, you know, how far we've come this year. Uh, has the market or the economy met pretty much those uh, expectations or assumptions you had or has it been any different? First of all, thanks Shamindra for having me here. Um, so in terms of, I think, looking in hindsight, I think a lot of things have gone right. Um, and we've seen the economy particularly picking up at a faster pace than one would have expected at the start of the year. I mean, if I was to just touch on a couple of key indicators that I think have really outperformed, one is particularly debt, for example, which is one key one that we've been looking at this year. Now we're at the stage where the DDO is, there's certainty around it, there's a lot more clarity, we're close to the finalization of it, which is, you know, quite a bit of a positive and there's been relatively less hiccups along that way. Um, even in terms of the numbers, debt to GDP, we were at about 128% at the end of 2022. As of the first quarter, we're at about 114%, obviously helped a lot by the fact that there was high inflation in that first quarter, as well as the appreciation of the currency. It might increase slightly now that some of those things have kind of changed. But we are seeing economic indicators turning in the right direction, even in terms of inflation. I think it has really beat our expectations. Um, even in terms of the central bank's own expectations, you can see that, you know, in that dot plot that they provide, that actual inflation has come even below kind of the fan chart levels they provided. And this, of course, means that it's well below the IMF expectations as we as well, which we know are significantly higher than that. So this has obviously allowed them to kind of move into an easing track faster than we would have expected. I think earlier, we were kind of expecting them to get to it around third, fourth quarter in terms of policy rate cuts. But of course, we've already seen 450 basis points in terms of a reduction. So that is, I think the timing is right and it works out quite well. Even on the external front, the currency appreciated much more, I think, than we expected. I mean, even in terms of the IMF forecast, they expected the currency to be around 396 for this by the end of this year. And we already have seen appreciation completely opposing that direction itself, right? Um, we don't necessarily expect more appreciation from this point, but we can see there's a lot more stability. Dollar liquidity positions are better. Uh, remittances have kind of picked up much more than we expected. Tourism arrivals also look very, very strong. So a lot of things have really gone right. And I think the right policies being in place, not backtracking on them, even in terms of SOE reforms, for example, I think things have moved at a relatively decent pace in the last couple of months. So, so there you are sitting and you're thinking, oh, this is really nice how things have gone or you're like, oh, wow, this is really beating any positive expectations we had. Yeah, I think it is definitely beating the positive expectations that we had. So, I mean, interest rates coming down so sharply so fast, I think is a big indication of that. The fact that sentiment has changed, that risk is now off. And of course, as you said, now the opportunity really is in equities uh, now that interest rates are so low. Thank you. Vajirupani, Vajirupani Bandaranaika is uh, head of research at 
NDB Securities. Uh, Vajrapani, we have a kind of serendipitous situation here also. I think, I don't know, maybe you will agree with me that, you know, Sri Lanka is tightening its budget, narrowing the deficit, while at the same time it's easing uh, monetary policy. You know, never have we had a situation where both of these would have been possible in the same way. You know, what are your thoughts? Um, I think I fully agree with what Trisha's uh, thesis also. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting time period uh, because like you said, from one hand we have the monetary easing happening and from the other hand we have the fiscal tightening happening. So I know people are very excited about the risky assets. Uh, and if you look at look back in 2011, you know, soon after the war and that monetary easing, fiscal reins being off, um, equities galloped. So I think this time around, uh, we are going to see equity party, but it's not going to be a party like we saw in 2010-11 time. Uh, we had this very interesting uh, uh, Goldilocks uh, crossroads where moderate, uh, growth is going to be moderate. It's going to be below the potential growth in the next foreseeable future. And then uh, we have the inflation uh, coming down and uh, from the other hand, monetary easing happening. So what this mean for equities is with the monetary easing happening, uh, we will see uh, asset prices getting repriced, including the risky assets uh, with the uh, discount rates coming down. And uh, also uh, belatedly we'll see uh, with the uh, with the credit growth also picking up, uh, that will also have ripple effects on the uh, market. Uh, so in terms of fiscal tightening, uh, now uh, this is going to be the biggest pain point uh, because 65% uh, of the GDP is driven by private consumption. So right. that piece is missing in the equation. Uh, so I think uh, altogether the market re-rating how uh, we can interpret this uh, it's not going to be a growth re-rating. It's going to be more of a valuation re-rating because of the recovery story from the bottom level we were in last year. Uh, and also together with the sentiments improving and also with the interest rate coming down, you're going to see um, access to cheap credit. So these, the, I think this is, this is what we believe uh, that the story for equity is going to be. So having this in mind, uh, we are um, uh, we remain uh, we like to remain invested in defensive aims, and also banking stocks. We still believe there's value in that, despite the recent run. Uh, and also, of course, there are a couple of uh, unloved stocks in the export sector, and perhaps even the, there are a couple of unloved dividend stocks. Uh, which are currently giving returns over the fixed income uh, uh, FD returns there. Um, yeah. So, so you mentioned this is uh, not a growth re-rating, but a valuation re-rating. Can you explain what you mean by that, right? So in, in terms of growth, you're referring to GDP growth and you don't anticipate high growth. You know, uh, what do you mean growth to valuation re-rating? Uh, see, um, if the growth uh, is uh, going, see if you can achieve the potential growth, then uh, you'll see um, uh, in terms of private consumption, in terms of government consumption, economic activities being activated. Oh. Like case in point, I mean, if you look at uh, a few years ago, uh, the fiscal, uh, uh, there was fiscal loosening happening and the government servants, they were given like a 10,000 rupee increments. Mm. Uh, so with all that, we saw uh, 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 overall economic activities increasing oh. and also with the government spending increasing, it will uh, spill down to the construction sector. Uh, so that piece in the puzzle is not going to be there. What we are going to see is uh, our valuations have been uber cheap mm. compared to the rest of the frontier market peers. So because we were cheap and uh, and we were there because of the sovereign debt restructuring happening. So since we are now coming out of it, gradually we will see valuation re-rating. And also uh, we need to understand again, um, cheap credit, that is also going to be a bigger drive with the market. So could even lead to misallocation of capital uh, but again, these are the these are the growth drivers to the market. Uh, 
let's talk about all that and then hi to dimanta matthew dimanta is a very frequent guest at echelon uh, thanks dimanta for coming here dimanta is the chief research and strategy officer at first capital uh, an investment bank both a primary dealership and um, and uh, you have a stockbroking uh, arm as well similar to cal really uh, dimanta uh, now it it looks like there's consensus we are a little surprised at how things quickly things turned around from where we were uh, in january um what's what's the outlook for equity as an asset class from where you are looking like yeah uh thanks shamindra for having me today so uh if you uh, really look at it um, in terms of uh, gdp um, so this year uh, we were looking at a negative gdp growth of uh, around uh, minus 3 to 4% uh however if you break up that uh, gdp uh, growth uh, as uh, which vajpani uh, pointed out uh, yes uh, private consumption has uh, significantly crashed and uh, that is one of the key reasons why we are having uh, negative gdp and um, so 11.8% in the first quarter negative so now what what we are looking at from here on is uh, if you take the second quarter uh, we think uh, things have sort of bottomed out there uh, which is the june quarter so uh, from there on uh, what we are mostly uh, looking at is a recovery story and the imf uh, timeline or the government's uh, timeline in terms of the uh, debt restructuring is happening uh, broadly on track so we were expecting somewhat of uh, delays more negotiations uh, to take place but then uh, not to be so so they are uh, sort of moving at a, a fast paced track inflation is uh, falling uh, faster than uh, anticipated so um, at least a couple of uh, 200 300 basis points uh, below Uh, our expectations so uh, with that uh, all positive news uh, coming up uh, we've also seen uh, the interest rates uh, crash significantly so uh, with that uh, overall uh, now we were looking at the gdp recovering towards the second half of the year mm. right and uh, positive gdp growth to mostly uh, come towards the fourth quarter and with that uh, we were looking at uh, some kind of a improvement in corporate earnings as well mm. so obviously with the interest rates coming down uh, you will see uh, finance cost and uh, consumer uh, side recovering so with that there is a improvement in uh, investor sentiment uh, likely to happen and uh, which is already Uh, happening and that is pushing the uh, equity market up and uh, so we were anyway looking at with this recovery story a positive returns for the equity market towards the second half of the year mm. and with the reform story and the government's or the economic recovery story uh, happening and uh, subject to that we think the econ- equity returns being positive that can continue for a further year as well right let me uh, quickly come to you uh, to talk about the economy some ask you for some forecast on some basic stuff right i'll i'll start with you dimanta you said uh, at the beginning of the year you were anticipating uh, minus 3 to 4% gdp in 2023 uh, is that still your forecast for 2023 so um, if you take uh, earlier uh, our forecast was slightly higher than that we were looking at uh, minus uh, 5 to 6% right and then uh, we got the first quarter uh, gdp growth figures which was slightly below our uh, expectations and with the recovery in consumer also starting to slowly take place uh, we've upgraded our forecast to Uh, minus three to four percent. It's going to be less worse than you thought at the beginning of the year. And Vajrapani, what were you thinking at the beginning of the year on GDP? And you know, have you had to adjust that that right now? We were also expecting the worst. We were mm. looking at about four uh, percent negative, mm. but now we are looking at about perhaps two percent or even less negative growth. 
and uh, Trisha. Uh, for the moment, we are expecting about negative one and a half percent. I think we were slightly a bit more negative, but it hasn't changed too much. I think we de- did expect some of this to come in, but I think, it, for example, policy rates coming down so fast really will help in terms of credit growth and picking up GDP at a faster pace. Tourism coming in, again, has a very much a trickle-down effect in terms of consumption as well, which I think can boost particularly the second half of the year. So I think I'm the most positive of the lot, but na- negative 1.5% is around there. Okay, so, so can I also ask you what you anticipate will happen with interest rates uh, from where they are uh, by the end of the year? Yeah, so I think um, interest rates have already fallen substantially. I think that risk premium has really come down. Um, I think there's a little bit of volatility in this period while we're still in between the actual exchange happening, which is kind of moving interest rates up and down slightly uh, right now. But The exchange you're referring to is the domestic debt the, restructuring. Yes, okay. correct, the domestic debt exchange. Um, I think while the finalization will happen, I think it was expected to happen end of July. They've extended it by a couple of weeks. Uh, but once that comes, I think that full risk premium will come off to a very large extent and then we'll see a little bit more stability. Um by the end of the year, we do expect, uh, for example, on the 12-month T-bill, we're expecting about uh, 10 to 12%, AWPLR maybe 100 bips above that. Um, I think there's a lot of catalysts that, again, can help interest rates to go down further apart from this DDO restructuring. Another one is that we expect policy rates to come down by another maybe 200 basis points at least for the second half of the year. Again, like Vajrapani mentioned, one reason is that we are below the potential GDP and that will entice the central bank to kind of keep rates lower and move it faster, encourage banks to lend and as such allow the economy to grow faster. Can I also quickly ask you, uh, do you have a forecast for the uh, forex exchange rate? What, what do you think it will be towards the year end? It's now 230 to the dollar. 320. 320 to the dollar. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we are expecting it somewhere around 320 to 330, maybe higher end of 335 at most. Um, I, don't, I, I would expect some level of stability now, not more appreciation. Possibly a little bit more depreciation towards the end of the year because we'll start having to make some of the payments that we've, of course, deferred for so long. But we also have about 900 million in inflows coming in. But all in all, it will balance out. So 320 to 330 is where I'd put the exchange rate at. Vajir Pani, same two questions to you. Uh, where do you anticipate interest rates to be year end and, um, and the dollar? Uh, so interest rates, if you look at uh, now the inflation, uh, it has been coming down very sharply from the gravity deeper in level mm-hmm. we saw last year. Uh, the latest NCPI print, uh, June print, it is at 12% uh, versus 22% in May. Uh, and the food inflation, it has come down to 2.5%. Uh, so looking ahead, we think the July print uh, the headline inflation will come down to 5 to 6%. And in the food inflation, it could even go to deflation level with import prices coming up. Uh, so in that context, if you look at the current policy rates uh, and the expected inflation, the spread is too much. We also expect uh, at, at minimum, uh, policy rate should come down by 200 to 300 basis at minimum. Uh, so what this uh, means for market interest rates would be uh, treasury bills, uh, now uh, it's at 14% level. We'll expect it will come down to about 10% level. And uh, PLR also, it's at uh, now 17%. We expect it could come down to about 12%. And the rupee? And uh, so exchange rate, uh, the, vol- the current volatility is more to do with the uh, banks building up their uh, foreign assets in lieu of the SLDB, uh, SLDB uh, uh, they have to build their NOP positions and uh, then for a lesser effect, uh, foreign outflows. Uh, so th- all this year we have seen about $500 foreign inflows to the GSEC market. And during last one month, we have seen about 35 to $40 million leaving. Uh, but I think uh, these uh, volatilities, these are short-lived and we might see rupee ending at about 330 to 340 level. But uh, beyond that point, uh, from 2024 onwards, we might say it will mean reverting to the usual 3 to 4%. Dimantha, same two questions to you. What do you anticipate will happen with interest rates towards the end of the year and also the exchange rate? Yeah. So uh, interest rates, uh, if we look at it, uh, what we are looking at is, uh, so uh, in terms, I'll start with the policy rates. So um, we have a view for the next 12 months. Now we've already seen a 200 basis point uh, rate cut and uh, we were 
we are looking at another uh, 200 basis points uh, possibly uh, so things are happening slightly faster than our uh, level of liking so uh, we were looking at uh, level of liking or level of forecast Uh, level of liking and forecasts uh, basically uh, so uh, the, that it, it could lead to a uh, heating up of the economy as well so that's why uh, we are saying it's a uh, level of liking so uh, now uh, we were looking at uh, possibly another 200 basis points either towards the uh, next uh, four to five months or even in the first quarter of uh, next year so uh, that's where we are looking at interest rate uh, policy rates to settle down somewhere around uh, 9 to uh, 10% uh, sdf at uh, 9% and slf at uh, 10% so and then uh, with that uh, we think uh, so poly, uh, interest rates are currently uh, around the level that we anticipated uh, post uh, ddo around the 13 to 15% mark slightly moved up with the recent uh, bond auction uh, however uh, beyond that uh, we are looking at uh, interest rates actually moving down to around 11 to 13.5% so to be very specific on the uh, yield curve uh, one year around the 11 to 12% mark five year and 10 year around the 12 half to uh, 13 half uh, spread range so uh, on the rupee then yes so uh, with that uh, on the rupee uh, we've actually upgraded our uh, forecast uh, with the uh, central bank actually uh, allowing the trend of the rupee to Uh, take place uh, rather than uh, absorbing the rupee contrary uh, to our view so uh, with that uh, the rupee appreciated and now uh, towards the end of the year the second half of the year with the import relaxations and possible uh, outflows of uh, with interest rates coming off uh, we're looking at uh, the uh, somewhat of a depreciating uh, trend and we're looking at the interest uh, exchange rate to be around the 320 to uh 360 mark we have a broader range uh, for the second half of the year and the same range for the first half uh, next year to be on to the lower side towards the end of this year and on to the higher side towards the end, uh, mid of next year uh, if we look at the potential i suppose for asset allocation uh, it looks like equity is 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 a no brainer currently right given that given what is likely to happen not so much what has happened uh, in the past so uh, so as if we are looking at equity as an asset class and i'll start with you ajirpani right okay so give us the give us the uh, give us the baseline situation you know uh, in terms of pe's where are we and what's your forecast for earnings in 2023 we've only so far seen the f- you know first quarter of 2023 being reported even even that's you know we are just starting to see those earnings coming in uh, so you know it's almost a 12 month uh, period that we are asking you to forecast you know um, uh, what's it looking like for equity um so market is now trading at about uh, a little below 6 times and uh, if you look at the previous imf programs uh, the cycles that we were in uh, the lowest we were been at about 7 and a half percent and the highest at 25 times and the mid range the average the medium has been about 13 to 12 percent but let's say this time it's different uh, previous imf program we never defaulted but this time okay let's say market uh, might re-rate to about nine times 10 times that what we are expecting Uh, and in terms of uh, earnings uh, now beginning of the year uh, we were uh, looking at market earnings coming down perhaps by even 20 30% but now that the situation has changed particularly with the banks being off from the uh, debt perimeter Uh, so you're going to see um, some sort of a provision reversals coming from that now especially from the ISB front uh if you look at like a exit yield about uh, you know i know it's a broad range but 10 to 16 then you're looking at about 45 cents to 50 cents per dollar 
uh, ISB. So for that, the banks have already provided about 35%. So in terms of incremental provision from SLDPs, it's going to be very less. And then from the SLDB front, uh, some banks have even provided about 30%. Uh, so now that the banks uh, uh, are likely to opt for the LKR option, so we'll see that provision also reversing back. And uh, with the uh, interest rates coming down sharply, uh, we might see private credit growth also picking up and that will also give some breather in terms of asset quality. So versus last year, what I'm trying to say is versus last year banking sector, they will see uh, their earnings improving. And also uh, last year, banking uh, sector was uh, not lending out, all the money being parked at common securities or from the DTO, market rates are collapsing. Uh, you're going, they're going to see windfall, windfall profits in terms of trading gains. Uh, also with the economic activities improving, and especially uh, with the import restrictions being up, that, that was a large function why the credit growth also was negative since June of last year. Uh, so with uh, all those picking up, is we will see a pickup in fund base and non-fund base income. Uh, so, and banking sector is a is a heavyweight sector in terms of market earnings. So, uh, right now, base case we are looking at uh, this year maybe uh, ten to fifteen percent earnings could come down. In the banking sector or the market? In the market. In as the a market whole. as a as a whole. Let's 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 come back to discussing the banks because I think uh, I don't know if you know off the top of your head what. Uh, percentage of market cap do the banks uh, count for? It used to be as high as 45%, I think. I, maybe it's lower no, now? Not so much, about 25 maybe. That's 30, I'm not yeah. sure of the number, but yeah. uh, I'm sure it's now not 40%. Because uh, because their, their prices have come down significantly versus uh, the book value, right? Trisha, let's come to you. Okay, so we know uh, the market as it stands is about 5.7 times, 6 times uh, earnings. Uh, PE rather, uh, what do you anticipate will happen with earnings market-wide in 2023? Yeah, earnings, our expectation is again very similar to Vajrapani's expectation and that minus 10% is what we're looking at right now. So I think the market has a significant upside even from this point. I mean, just in the last month, the SPI has moved up about 90 to 20%. Um, and we, I think we can easily see the market hitting even 13,000 levels by the end of the year. And even at that, I think we'd still be trading at eight to nine times based on that kind of earnings. So there is quite a bit of positivity that will come in, in addition to the banking sector performing well, I think on a broader scale, uh, finance cost reduction that really weighed on a lot of the corporates will now start being reversed, or you'll see that impact kind of uh, helping their bottom lines rather. So you will see second half, I think we'd be seeing corporate earnings really started to pick up. So for the, the This June quarter might still be a little bit dull, but we'll start seeing it reflecting from the third and fourth quarter. All right. Uh, to you, Dimanta, uh, uh, what do you think earnings will be in 2023? Uh, perhaps even you can tell us what 2024 is uh, if you have a forecast for that. Yeah. So uh, if you uh, look at the earnings, so... Uh, um, uh, we were having uh, we are having a slightly more uh, bullish view uh, than uh, Vajrapani and Trisha. So uh, uh, we've actually upgraded our earnings uh, uh, forecast recently. So with the upgrade of uh, GDP growth, uh, we slightly upgraded our earnings uh, forecast. Uh, so earlier we were at around uh, minus uh, 10 to 11 percent, but now uh, we've brought it down to or uh, improved it to minus uh, 5% uh, for this year. And then uh, we're looking at around 19% uh, to 20% uh, earnings growth for next year. Okay, I'll quickly come to the two of you on 2024 earnings uh, growth. Uh, do you have a number, Vajrapani? Uh, so we are looking at about uh, base case 10 to 10% 10 sort of. Right, and Trisha? Um, it's going to be a ballpark figure because a lot sure. of things can change towards the end of the year, but I'd probably go with about 20% in terms of increase in your names. Is, is it fair to think that you are generally, as analysts, you're being, you're, you prefer to err on caution versus, you know, gallop ahead and, and be more 
be optimistic in that sense? Um, in some cases, yes. But I think, I mean, the evidence of Sri Lanka's performance over the last couple of years and how many crises we've had to deal with and how many changes we have had to deal with, I think, puts us on the side of caution a little bit more. It's difficult to forecast too far ahead because things can change a lot. And I think this topic will come up. But of course, politics is one big change that one big change that can derail things or move things in the right direction. As you've seen, the last seat is in the right direction. But going forward, you know, it's it's up to anyone's call in terms of how that will work out. Sure. So, so it, when you're sort of analyzing the market right now, can you uh, and and trying to forecast what market wide earnings are going to be in the in this year and next year, can you really weigh what politics, what role politics will have in them? You you, you are not doing that right now, right? So, so by extension, I mean there is a proposed reform agenda. Can you bring that into what will happen to earnings as a result of that? For this year, I think it is much less of a factor. It's mm. much more of a factor for second half of next year. I think even first half of next year, I think we'd still be continuing on this kind of fiscal reform path, the correct monetary cycle that will be taking uh, place going forward. I think we'd be moving in the right direction at least for the next 12 months. But after that, I think it's it's a little bit more uncertain. Okay, so Vajrapani, if Sri Lanka can stick to its uh, agreement with the International Monetary Fund, then a lot of these reforms that we are now talking about, the structural reforms in the economy, uh, will have to be done uh, in 2023 and uh, 2024. Are you factoring the impact of something like that onto earnings? Or is, is it too, uh, too uh, sort of hazy for you to make? Put that into numbers. Well, there are a lot of moving pieces right now, mm. and the biggest being the political risk. Sure. Uh, so right now, stability is of utmost importance, mm. uh, and the second reason, another risk is uh, is the weather-related risk. Uh, now, uh, some uh, analysts they expect, I mean, could be like an El Nino impact coming, mm. and then the next Maha season could get affected. Mm. So. Uh, from this point to uh, next year, there's a lot of moving pieces, but base case, uh, I think I broadly agree with what the two analysts said. And also, um, uh, tracing back to now, despite why uh, earnings coming down, why we are so bullish about the market, and could mm. is, is that even a mm. possibility? Uh, if you look at um, last uh, 15 years, um, the market has gained about, uh, market has recorded gains uh, eight years. And of that eight years, also 50% uh, of those gains because of PE expansion. So this is also what we're looking at broadly, a PE expansion to happen. I mean, if somebody's thinking, you know, if the market earnings coming down, then why are you expecting the uh, market to improve? Okay, so uh, if you look towards the end of the year, where do you anticipate market PE uh, will be based on your forecast of uh, earnings? Uh, what does uh, PE uh, We are looking at about 9 to 10 times PE from the current right. level. And, and how does that compare with, uh, uh, I don't know, in the region, countries uh, with a similar... Credit rating, well, that wouldn't look good, but, but countries in a similar state of development, where where does 9 to 10% rank? Uh, I think Vietnam, uh, Vietnam, Bangladesh, they are ahead of us. Uh, I think Pakistan also a little bit uh, ahead of us, uh, um, despite the current uh, political uh, uh, crisis they are going through. Uh, so I think we are still very much uh, undervalued. And even if you look at the banking sector also, we are still at uh, 0.5 times price to book when you look at the frontier market uh, PS. Uh, so that is still valid. Right. And, and Dimanta, uh, if, if you look at your forecast, own forecast for earnings growth, uh, what do you uh, anticipate will happen with the price to earnings ratio? Yeah. On so those uh, let me slightly uh, expand on what uh, Vajrapani told about uh, some negative uh, earnings growth, uh, but the market Market's uh, rising. Yeah. Market rising. So mm, we are also on, the, on a similar ground where uh, we think uh, now, uh, why we are expecting now we, our. Uh, ASPI target for this year was uh, 11,000 to 12,000 and we are still holding it and it's now obviously significantly moved up and very closer to that target. When you started the year, you had a lower ASPI target. So this is your revised ASPI target, 11,000 to 12,000? No, no. 12,000, uh, 11 to 12,000 was the uh, target. Right. Okay. 
So um, why we are having uh, this here was uh, basically again uh, we are also looking at a, a re-rating of the uh, PE around uh, 8.5 times uh, for this year. Uh, so this year we are looking at only uh, uh, PE uh, re-rating of the market but uh, next year we are uh, looking at more earnings growth coming in and also uh, PE re-rating. So if you look at the market, uh, market always uh, the equity market always trades ahead of uh, sort of one year ahead of uh, its expectation so that's why uh, you see before the recovery starting to hap happen on expectation of the recovery and or earnings recovery uh, the market, uh, the equity market has started to move and why it's moving at a, this kind of accelerated pace is simply because uh, uh, all the economic indicators are improving at a uh, accelerated pace where you see uh, inflation falling uh, below the level of uh, expectation, um, so interest rates falling uh, ahead of uh, expectations. So similarly, uh, corporate earnings are expected to slightly recover uh, possibly ahead of expectations so with the finance cost uh, coming down consumer demand starting to pick up uh, also there is a push from the central bank to bring down uh, interest bank interest rates at a much uh, faster pace so all that could affect uh, corporate earnings uh, much more uh, positively uh, than uh, one anticipates so with that uh, within the re-rating also might happen uh, faster. So for next year we are looking at a, a target of uh, 14,000 to 15,000 for the index. So um, if you look at a PE we are looking at again uh, similar numbers we are looking at uh, 10 times uh, PE uh, with an earnings growth of around 20% uh, for next year. Right, so so in 2024, you expect earnings to drive the PE, whereas this year in 2020, it's going to be purely uh, the price, price to earnings ra ratio or the market re-rating uh, valuations re-rating. If yeah. I can just add in terms of the re-rating point, I mean, of course, in terms of PE as well, there has there needs to be that re-rating. But also, if you look at it, actually, in terms of an inflation-adjusted mm -hmm. basis, yes. most asset prices have adjusted already, but the market has not. So if you look at it, even on, in real terms, it's about 50% discount in terms of where it should be in terms of nominal. Um, it may be a little bit less now because inflation is coming down a little bit faster, but there's a significant increase in that gap between the real and nominal in terms of, if you look at the, just on an inflation adjusted basis. So that, that re-rating also needs to happen. Most assets have already repriced, but we haven't seen that happen in the equity market yet. Exactly, adding on to that. Uh, so if you take on the consumer uh, demand side of it, now, uh, what we are expecting is now we all know that purchasing power has significantly uh, crashed with the private consumption also uh, significantly declining. Now, uh, with most asset classes uh, re-rating uh, with the depreciation of the currency, so we think uh, purchasing power is likely to come back to the uh, original levels. Obviously, it's going to take uh, much more time uh, than uh, uh, last uh, last time because uh, we are coming out of economic crisis but we think over a three year period uh, the purchasing power will uh, come back to somewhere close to uh, where it was so real wages are likely to uh, rise uh, bringing back uh, that uh, earnings power with the lower inflation that is there so uh, with that uh, there's higher uh, probability of uh, consumer demand uh, improving and the volumes of uh, corporates coming back to uh, where they were uh, bringing up earnings. Right. And we, we started, uh, at least we mentioned banks uh, and their relatively uh, low valuation um, uh, in terms of price to books. Uh, they were at a low of 0.3 approximately across the sector. Now they are, you, know, you say it's like 0.5 despite banking stocks having virtually doubled, I think, in the uh, since um, in the last two months, maybe. Um, uh, how would you suggest, uh, how should investors look at this, right? Uh, sure, there is more clarity 
because we know what's going to happen with the domestic debt restructuring. There is some expectation about what will happen with uh, international sovereign bond restructuring and their impact on banks. Provisions have already been made. Uh, have, have all known factors been priced in? What about the quality of the loan book? What about liquidity and such matters? Uh, I can, if I can start with you, Trisha, on bank valuations and because they're a big sector in the market. Yeah. So in terms of bank valuations, as you mentioned, it's at about 0.5. I mean, historically, I think it has been anything above one, sometimes two and a half times at its peak. But I think even globally, bank valuations are now a little bit more at a discount because there's to some extent over-regulation in the sector that has, I mean, in the last couple of months, the Silicon Valley Bank crash, all of that has really factored into bank valuations coming off. And we don't necessarily expect it to be at those historical levels, but probably a little bit lower than that. There should be some kind of a uh, discount factored in right now. But still, I think there is potential for more upside. As you mentioned, most banks, I think, have for a to a large extent, taken the necessary provisions. I think one that stands out to us is really in terms of HNB. They've done, I think, 72 billion or so in terms of impairment and loan and SLDB provisioning over the last year. Um, and I, so I think in terms of NPLs, they are still on a rising trajectory. So that's something to be wary of. But uh, banks that have really done management overlays in terms of their impairments is one that I would, you know, wait a little bit more heavily in terms of looking at that upside versus versus uh, banks that have maybe waited less on stage three loans and more in terms of stage two loans. For example, commercial bank has done a little bit more provision on stage two versus stage three. Uh, so things like that are some things to kind of take note of. But I mean, things can change. Uh, the economy is improving. People are kind of going back to their normal levels. And I think eventually they'll start kind of paying off those restructured loans. So things can turn around. Uh, but if you're looking at kind of safety right now, there are a few banks that, of course, have provided a lot more. But I think as a whole, the sector really requires a re-rating right now. Everyone's provided, uh, quite, everyone's provided quite decently. But if you're looking at what's more safe versus a little bit less safe, uh, that's par part of how I would look at it. Because I think, by and large, the risk of external debt restructure has been factored across most of the banks, maybe commercial HNB, which had bought a little bit at the higher prices, maybe have a little bit more to provide compared to some of the others. Um, but NPLs, I think, will start seeing it taper off towards, again, the second half of the year. Um, and then, again, it means that there's probably pro uh, possibilities for reversals in terms of loan loss provisioning as well. But so, so you're saying banks will not be valued at the heady, you know, two times book or two and a half times book in the future. Uh, but is one times book, one and a half times book a realistic uh, thing in Sri Lanka over the medium term? Uh, I'd probably be a little bit more conservative. I think one, two, you know, even 0.9 or so is probably where it would kind of stand at. Mm. What we understand is that there is a little bit of reluctance, particularly in terms of foreign investors, mm. getting into the financial sector because uh -huh. they have been hurt by what has happened globally. So they right. don't necessarily look at financial stocks within more risky markets as well. And they know the amount of regulatory forbearance that has been already provided in terms of the banking books. So, you know, they consider those factors as well. So I would say probably 0 0.9 to maximum one times book value is where we probably revert to. Uh, what do you suggest? What do you think will happen with uh, bank valuations uh, broadly, Vajrapani? You know, 0.5 times book. You know, this has been a, a solid asset class in the past. Uh, what is likely to happen? Um, I agree with what Trisha said. In addition to what she said, uh, I also don't expect um, uh, uh, banking sector ratings to go to level where they were. And if you look at Vietnam, they are at about I think 1.5 times uh, uh, PBV. But then again, um, if you look at our effective tax rates, now it's at 50 percent, whereas in Vietnam it's 20 percent. Oh, so okay. it explains why uh, mm. investors are queuing up, uh, mm. you know, at Vietnam to mm. do business. Uh, but uh, by and large, uh, I think uh, we may see uh, uh, in the short run uh, banking sector valuations re-rating uh, to 0 0.8, 0 0.9. That's that's a given because um, credit growth is yet to pick up from June of last year. The cre private sector credit growth has been negative. So that has to pick up with the interest rates coming down with the uh, 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 import restrictions coming off, so that will entice banking sector lending, and especially now where the sovereign risk is largely off the table. Uh, NIMS will come down, uh, 
uh, with the falling interest rates and obviously uh, banks bank lending rates are anyway downwards sticky uh, that has been the case uh, historically also it is multiple reason because banking in especially in our banking sector 30 30 to 35% is still held by the state banks that is the and then the banks menu cost the customer switching cost so in addition to those the traditional problems um, since uh, 2019 with the easter sunday attack the banks are burdened with like a with a quite hefty uh, uh, npl uh, asset portfolio uh, i think uh, nearly 15% of the banking book uh, is uh, now has gone through some sort of a restructuring uh, stage 3 loans are now at 13% stage 2 and 3 put together that's about 30% and stage 3 provision in 45% still so there is still room from that front to happen but i think uh, with this interest rate coming down and gradually with the economic activity speaking up perhaps from fourth quarter and beyond fourth quarter uh we will see banking sector also um uh operate in operating profit level you know they they're going to do well and uh, just for clarity this stage 2 3 loans you are referring to is a classification that's coming after ifrs, IFRS 9, 9 yes. and then this is how npls are now classified in in the financial sector uh, stage 3 are the you know uh, it's the uh, npls the classification it's basically yeah. npls in the book yeah. uh, stage 2 is the ones that are closest to that npl status and you're saying um stage 2 and 3 together are around 30% in the sector uh, dimanta again banking you know banking has been a sector where foreign investors have favored financial sector in general banks in particular because because they are large they are liquid in sri lanka do you think that for foreign investors will look at the sector in the same way for reasons that trisha is suggesting um so uh, shamindra banks are more uh, uh economy uh sort of play uh, in the market yeah. and uh, so uh, if you look at what we are expecting uh, now the economy we are looking at a sort of a gradual uh, improvement but uh, the, from where we are currently uh, the slightest deviation it doesn't take a long period uh, for us to go back uh, into a big hole right right so uh, it's the same for uh, banks so economy uh, goes down so does the bank so uh, it's not that we are out of a, a significant uh, risk uh, as yet so um, earlier we've seen uh, uh, sri lanka in uh, more or less uh, ba- bands of payment crises every almost every four years but now with at the current state uh, we could easily within 6 8 months go back to uh where we were so uh, definitely we you can't uh, expect uh, banks to go back to their uh, two times uh, sort of uh, valuation uh, that we've seen in the past so i agree with uh, trisha and uh, vajrapani uh, our target is uh, ranging from uh, 0.8 times to uh, one time and uh, that also uh, we are more or less a bit more uh, defensive uh, uh, exactly as uh, trisha mentioned so we like to be in the more uh, bigger banks commercial hnb sampat and um, ntb for having the lowest uh, loan uh, npl ratios so with that uh, we think uh, now with the economy uh, reviving uh, of course uh, the uh return on equity of these banks also may start to uh, improve with uh, some amount of uh, reversals also likely to happen now uh, f- tourism is a key sector uh, to look at we are seeing a significant improvement a recovery happening after a very long time and uh, that too is happening at a much much faster pace that than we all anticipate so we've seen tourist arrivals 100000 last month after 4 years first time after 4 years so uh, that segment is a key segment in the uh, banking uh, lending books as well so uh, that segment recovery is brings in uh, an important sector into play for the banks 
right? Because there has been continuous moratoriums in this uh, sector happening. So uh, that is so with these moratoriums now going out of the picture, economy recovering, and uh, NPS possibly uh, likely to reverse. Let's say. Uh, second quarter, third quarter of uh, next year, these things starting to happen. Uh, then uh, we see uh, the banks uh, probably moving more closer towards that uh, one times mark, but obviously that economic risk still lies in those banks. Uh, I'd like to add to Dimanta, I think even if we do uh, valuation for the banks for the longest time, uh, the cost of capital has been higher than the uh, returns. And for that matter, you know, residual income has yes. been, you know, uh, it's been negative. Uh, so it's very important. I mean, good in a way, in a way, we see now the cost of capital coming down. And also, uh, you know, if these things can improve, you know, from fund based income, from non fund based income and the provision reversal is happening. And if that can push the uh, returns, return on equity higher, uh, we will definitely see a meaningful re-rating. Re uh, so evidently, uh uh, an equity portfolio now should have exposure to the big uh, liquid banks uh, which have uh, which are likely to you know weather the storm better uh, but what else does a portfolio have to include Trisha very broadly speaking right you know uh, uh, there is more diversity in the market in terms of you know stocks right now than we had 10 years ago it was very unrepresentative of what the market is, what, what the Sri Lankan economy is so so what else should uh, investors broadly look at uh, so in terms of your portfolio allocation I mean banks of course right now is one um, I would also probably look at a mixture so for example there are counters that have been quite discounted because of how things have affected them so far. So for example, big names that again get very, uh, get a lot of prominence again in the foreign participants mm. uh, market, for example, Dialogue, JKH, uh, Hemas even right now. So those ones are getting a little bit more attention and we're seeing that value pick up coming in since this re-rating has started happening as well, you're seeing, but they're still trading at, uh, you know, well below book. Um, so there's quite a bit of re-rating to happen in those uh, counters. Uh, then, for example, you also look at dividend counters right now. I mean, if you're trying to very much compare between fixed income returns versus dividend returns, so fixed income, say you park it at a one year, uh, you get 10%, 36% of tax, you effectively 6 to 7% is what you're really earning. Whereas you have counters like CTC, DST, for example, that give you well above 15% return and maybe at around 15% tax, you're still earning a little bit above that. So if you're not as much a risk taker, Dividend, good dividend yielding counters are also things that you want to kind of park your money in. Um, then you have to kind of look a little bit ahead beyond this initial period. Are consumer kind of companies going to perform really well? I mean, that's where I think we see the next turn of things. I think we haven't started really seeing it yet. Uh, and the numbers are not really f reflecting it even in terms of macroeconomic indicators. We haven't seen those turns happening yet, but it is something to look forward to in terms of when that pickup might happen and whether you want to position yourself for that right now. Um, I mean, then again, you're talking about counters like HEMAS, again, CTC, DST, um, counters like that, again, again, impacted very much by the trickle down effects of tourism, for example, picking up um, CCS, Cargills, things like that, consumer companies, again, very foreign heavy companies there as well. So there's quite a bit of a merge between those two worlds that happen that will give that kind of upside for an investor right now. Uh, but I think broadly, right now, the favorite, of course, is the financial sector in terms of banks, NBFIs as well, uh, that are looking quite attractive in this current environment. Uh, Vajrapani, to your thesis that you sort of alluded to at the beginning of, you know, you will want to be right now in banks and also so-called defensive stocks, you know, high dividend yield uh, stocks that have been like more or less stable, right? Uh, talk to us about time frames, okay? This is the strategy you suggest people use. Then, are they going to stick to this? When do you, when? What are the indicators they should be watching uh, to you know shift to the stocks that Trisha is talking about here? Um, I broadly agree with the names Trisha suggested. Um, in the defensive sector, again, uh, tail calls. So, if you look at uh, for that matter, dialogue. Um, so, last year was the year we saw. Uh, the worst economic growth in the country, uh, uh, negative growth. So despite that, uh, the the mobile data grew uh, 
uh, at 22 percent. So what this means is mobile data is now like a necessity. Uh, so for that matter, we believe they have a very nice defensive business, which uh, uh, leads to very sticky demand. Uh, and the dialogue's biggest pain point had been uh, the, uh, at one point that about $200 million uh, foreign liabilities. So for which now they are prepaying and they are even looking at capital augmentation plans. Uh, and in the other defensive, uh, we like uh, some of the consumer staple names, uh, that of Ceylon uh, uh, Coal Stores, that of Cargill's. Uh, and I, now the John Keel's uh, results were out this week, and there we saw, uh, particularly in uh, Keel's, uh, the modern trade business, Keel's business, uh, the same store sales growth had uh, had been predominantly driven by footfall growth, whereas previously what we saw was it was driven by the basket value, and the basket value is not distorted because of the uh, uh, the COVID lockdowns and everything that we have gone through. But now we see footfall returning, 15% footfall growth, uh, which is very encouraging. And given that uh, modern trade business, they cater to that of uh, uh, necessity type of goods. So they will also be able to uh, maintain pricing power and, and maintain margins also. Uh, in addition, uh, even Cargill's for that matter, uh, same story, and they recently opened their uh, distribution center, centralized distribution center, so with that they are going to see a lot of cost efficiencies coming in. Uh, again, in the defensive, we like uh, pharma, again, a very defensive sector, so even if you look at Sunshine, uh, Hamas, they also have uh, into uh, pharma distribution and pharma manufacturing. Uh, and Sunshine also, they are uh, leaner manufacturing. They are mainly into respiratory devices manufacturing. Uh, that also, uh, now with, it has uh, reached the break-even profit level. And then here, must this uh, Morrison plant, they start last year, first quarter. Again, they are looking at 5 billion uh, uh, tablets and 2 million liters of medicine. Again, uh, what is interesting uh, in pharma sector is the growth and the total addressable market remained large uh, because right now we import 13% of our requirement, uh, whereas the government is now looking at increasing local manufacturing in the medium term to 25% and in the longer term to 40%, So, which means there's a huge growth potential in the pharma sector. Uh, and so after that, again, banks we discuss. And in the uh, in terms of uh, uh, dividend stocks, we like uh, that of CTC, that of Lubrican. Lubrican also, they will benefit uh, now uh, with the uh, full quota limits. Now it has been uh, extended and it will, uh, the quota limits are set to be increased again or completely being taken off. So you'll see more vehicles moving, economic activities picking up. So that will help them in terms of demand and also with the soft commodity prices that will help with the margins. Uh, so right now, uh, uh, lubricant dividend yields at about 14%. And you have CTC also, CTC again around same dividend yield level. Again, um, now, uh, now, CTC, uh, we used to say it has a very good pricing power in elastic demand. Now, that is lost uh, because now uh, with the recent uh, price hike 20% in July, I think uh, from our channel checks, what we hear is their volumes have come down about 30%. But still, they will continue to defend their margins. Uh, so perhaps that is also uh, another sector, uh, another uh, counter one can look at. In addition to that, um, we like uh, export stocks, particularly the fabric stocks, uh, why um, they're currently being unloved, uh, main reason being uh, the, their um, capacity utilization has come down about 30-40%. Uh, that was because the inventory level is being high in the buyer's market uh, and also with the economic recession that was there. But uh, if you look at now the bias market, the US market, uh, now yesterday was, there was a hike and uh, the, the base case scenario is it's going to be a pause or even a pivot could happen. The labor numbers are strong in the US, retail numbers are higher than the consensus and the earning number, the, the, this earning season, the numbers are actually good. 
Uh, so uh, that is from the US and from the EU also, they have managed to um, uh, avert energy driven uh, recession also, even their numbers are looking good. So I think from 4Q onwards, we will see uh, a recovery uh, in those bias market uh, and that's and the fabric more stocks demand. you're referring to are Hela and Texter Jersey? Uh, MGT, MGT M uh, and Texter Jersey. Right. So in addition to demand recovery, uh, we recently uh, got the GSP plus extension mm -hmm. that will also help and also with the rupee depreciation uh, that will also help the export counters. Right. So, so the financial sector stocks, so-called defensive stocks, but a lot of consumer stocks in there um, and some high yield, uh, high dividend yield stocks. Plus unloved. Right? Unloved export yeah. stocks. And so also, we, sorry. Go, go ahead. I mean, I think one can even look at some tactical allocations into like that of plantation stocks also. We like the uh, uh, PO play tea companies uh, because rupee depreciating that is helping. And now that the uh, fertilizer, uh, that fiasco is now behind us, uh, we see the volumes also recovering. Uh, so that will also help the plantation. But one, one should know that, I mean, when you're in a uh, cyclical stock like that, you should uh, know when to exit, where to exit, because otherwise, if you meet, miss the exit point, the market can become unforgiving. Brilliant. So so you, you there, there must be 25 stocks in that bunch that you're talking about. So super diversified portfolio. Okay. Uh, Dimant, the challenge is to narrow this down. Okay. <laughs> Financial yeah. stocks or banks are still good. Uh, we haven't really talked about the NBFIs or non-bank financial institutions, but but how, how do you allocate in this uh, in this climate? Yeah. So I agree with uh, Trisha and uh, Vajrapani on the stock. So uh, definitely uh, defensive Going defensive is the way to go in this market because of this uh, economic uh, situation. You have to define what you mean by defensive. What yes. are the two or three factors that you would consider yes. as so, defensive? Uh, I will come to that. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, three factors I want to uh, mention. One, uh, look at defensive. Uh, secondly, foreign investable stocks. And third is the consumer. Right. right? So uh, when you say defensive... Uh, it could be high dividend yielding. Uh, it could be uh, large stocks like uh, even uh, John Keyes. Then um, we are looking at uh, dividend yielding stocks like uh, CTC, Lubricants. So uh, all these are uh, considered somewhat uh, defensive. Uh, also, uh, there are some uh, consumer uh, stocks that we like. Right, um, uh, nothing too different to uh, what uh, both of the other analysts uh, mentioned. So we are very uh, positive on uh, HEMAS and uh, especially because of its uh, pharma business uh, that is uh, coming up now and uh, the manufacturing that is starting to accelerate there and not only that but the consumer part of their business because of the economy picking up uh, in Sri Lanka. So uh, in addition to that if you really take the banking stocks that is also somewhat of a uh, consumer uh, related stocks because uh, it's more or less uh, private uh, consumption that's get uh, reactivated uh, through this so uh, credit be uh, picking up is a key element uh, we are looking at now currently uh, private credit is uh, minus uh, 5 percent 5.3 percent but uh, we think uh, it will start to improve now and we think it will end up at plus one percent for this year so basically a positive growth in credit uh, towards the end of the year especially in the last quarter and uh, then going up onto a 7.5% uh, growth of credit for next year. So uh, obviously, if you look at the historical uh, numbers, uh, these numbers might be slightly onto the uh, lower side uh, in terms of growth. But uh, that you have to take in uh, context of their liquidity positions as well. Right, uh, because they've done a lot of uh, NPL provisioning. So uh, with that, uh, overall uh, capital adequacy levels are low. So all that taken into account, uh, there's a limit that they can really uh, grow as well. So you can't go real aggressive on the private sector credit growth as well. 
so in addition to that um, so uh, another type of uh, consumer is the telecom sector because uh, if you really look at it people most people uh, before they uh, start to eat and drink they would go and put the reload right so uh, that is a key element that's one of the key reasons why uh, as uh, vajrapani pointed out the data uh, segment is uh, growing even in a uh, negative uh, gdp growth uh, environment and we think uh, that will uh, that has further uh, room to grow and uh, it will further accelerate when economic growth uh, picks up significantly so uh, that is another area then obviously banking finance is a area that you can look at you'll have to look at now itself because you won't be able to uh, by the time um, the import relaxation into uh, vehicles happen so uh, in terms of most of this in by nbfi sector it's mostly uh, vehicle uh, related in somewhat even if it's uh, loans it's somewhat related to uh, vehicles so basically i think uh, you probably need to at least the look at the larger uh, nbfi uh, segment stocks like um, let's say uh, people's leasing uh, maybe central finance maybe uh, lb finance commercial credit maybe so uh, like that the larger players at least uh, at this point of time uh, before the uh, relaxations uh start happening because the market as i said earlier market moves uh, well ahead of its uh, time and you will see with the banks now uh, accelerated and coming closer to 0.5 0.6 times people uh, investors will look at uh, stars into the future right so the so the, that's the first part of your thesis which is the defensive part then you yeah. said uh, foreign investor investable yes. so foreign investor investable also uh, the stocks like the most liquid one is going to be uh, john keers right and uh, also uh, possibly somewhat into hemas if you like the uh, consumer uh, element of it um, so uh, one key thing uh, for uh, foreign investors is uh, how can i uh, benefit from the a recovery of the economy and the liquidity factor so then in such a uh, situation we think uh, the bigger banking players and uh, these uh, liquid stocks such as john keys and hemas are going to play a key role uh, in uh, in the uh, in their segment uh, that they're looking at in addition to that uh, there's a lot of other uh consumer uh, stuff uh, when you look at we are giving more priority to uh, food beverage and tobacco so uh, one element of that as vajrapani mentioned is uh, ceylon tobacco obviously that comes uh, also under the defensive category as well uh, then uh, we also uh, kind of like uh, the stocks such as uh, ccs again that was also mentioned so there is a not there's not a lot of uh, liquid stocks in this uh, segment uh, so ceylon uh, coal stores and possibly uh, somewhat cargis maybe uh, some things to uh, look at uh, going beyond that uh, possibly uh, some of the essential uh, food items you can uh, take in take into account uh, such as the uh, poultry segment so uh, gran uh, grain elevators uh, bairaha uh, is uh, some of the uh, stocks that uh, relate is more uh, related to the uh, food segment that is uh, in, uh, important for a uh, investor's uh, perspective you know if you are looking at diversifying your portfolio as well right uh, all right folks that's uh, been a fairly wide ranging diverse conversation you've sort of talked about strategy and potentially how you can deploy a, a deploy a portfolio uh, shall we get to some closing uh, thoughts can i uh, start with you trisha anything you want to add uh, before we close um i think broadly to sum up i think we're in a good footing right now mm. and hopefully we can maintain on this path mm. um as a result of that in terms of asset class allocation equities is where we would 
primarily kind of look at right now, I think there's a very strong case in terms of interest rates coming down, alternative asset classes not looking as attractive, the re-rating that is warranted, as well as foreign participation that will eventually come. I think that is kind of yet to come, but I think once the external debt restructure is finalized, we will start seeing that and that will be the next big catalyst, I think, for the equity markets. So all in all, I think right now things are looking a little bit more positive, but of course, be wary of the fact that policies can change and politics can change policies. So that's just something to kind of keep in mind. Vajrupani, final thoughts. Uh, so I think even if you look at from the global asset manager's perspective, uh, I think uh, this year and the next year it's going to be uh, the frontier and the emerging markets are going to be their darlings. Uh, because with the dollar uh, uh, depreciating, if you look at the DXY, the dollar index, it has already depreciated by 5% by TD. So you'd see money flowing to this part of the world. And in the frontier space in this part of the world, I think uh, given our valuations, given our recovery story, uh, we are in a better footing because Pakistan have their own set of problems. And then Bangladesh also, they have a daily trading ban, so which is, you know, fearing away the investors. So I think us and Vietnam perhaps uh, would be in a, in a nice place in the eyes of frontier market investors. So stay invested. Uh, risky assets uh, would be a good place to be in. But uh, I mean, obviously, you need to do your, um, you need to be wary of there are a lot of moving pieces right now. Um, and also, obviously, uh, it's important to manage cognitive biases also. And the month. Yeah. So uh, we've already uh, increased uh, allocation uh, into equity in terms of our uh, recommendations. So uh, out of your equity allocated um, segment of stocks, we've uh, told you to uh, put in 85% uh, into uh, equity and keep about uh, 15% in cash for potential opportunities. Now, uh, probably it's time to put the uh, balance pieces also in. So with the rates coming down, we think uh, there's more room for the uh, equity market to move. Obviously, we're looking at 12,000 for this year and 15,000 for the all share price index uh, for next year, which uh, leaves a lot of uh, upside uh, for an uh, uh, equity investor. So, uh, obviously, uh, the economic risks uh, stay the same, uh, the things can change very quickly, but uh, there's a lot of potential at least over the next uh, 12 to uh, 15 months uh, for things to go in the right direction with uh, po uh, political side and the uh, policy environment more or less uh, stable over the next uh, 12 to 15 months because there's unlikely of any elections that is likely to happen. So uh, with that uh, stability in place, we think there's a, a lot of uh, room for uh, a reduced uh, risk uh, environment uh, in the economy and uh, with that uh, there will be more investments coming into uh, equity and uh, we feel uh, we are already seeing uh, equity uh, the investors or fresh funds coming into equity on the local front and uh, obviously on the foreign front it has been uh, slightly slower than uh, anticipated we would have uh, expected more investments uh, to uh, come in uh, earlier than uh, later. Uh, however, possibly most uh, foreign investors are waiting uh, for the uh, DDR or sorry, for the debt restructuring on the external front to get uh, completed. So with that uh, confidence in place, uh, foreign in, uh, fresh funds from that side is also likely to uh, come in creating uh, significant more demand and positive returns for equity. Dimanta Matthew, Vajrupani, Bandarnaika, Trisha Piris, this was a fantastic chat. Thank you so much for joining us at Echelon. Thank, Thank you, you for inviting me.